Um, hello, everyone. Uh, very lovely to have you here, and thanks uh, to Yanis and Helene for creating this amazing space here in Limassol. It's really very special what you do here, and uh, it's an honour for us to be part of it. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm Ruth Catlow, and this is Mark Garrett, who will introduce himself in a short <laughs> while. Uh, we're, as Yanis said, we're both artists and we're co-directors of Furtherfield. So, um, our presentation today is called Do It With Others, Daiwo, From the Web to the Blockchain. Um, I'm just going to kick off with a short introduction to Furtherfield. This was the planned schedule, which has been thrown out somewhat by our friends at the festival. But we'll, we'll kind of improvise and see, what, see how it works best for everyone. Um, so I'll give a short intro to Furtherfield and a little bit about our history because it will make everything we say make more sense. Uh, Mark is then going to follow with a presentation of the kind of theoretical and uh, re reflective grounding on our practice and it's, it's more about the kind of politics and the ethics and what drives, the kind of underpinning ethics of what drives us. Um, I will then talk about our work with the blockchain, uh, what is the blockchain, why we think it's interesting and what artists are bringing to the space and why we think it's important for artists to bring to the space. Um, we have a planned workshop in which uh, we are going to invite you to uh, help us think through a blockchain based platform for public art commissioning. We're going to build something in London, but we're really interested in it being a kind of federated thing so that it's operating in different countries uh, for a kind of international network of artists and venues. And we hope that you're going to help us think that through. So, uh, maybe I'll come to that in a minute. So, uh, further field, um, we started in the mid 90s as the web was taking off as a place that anyone could publish to. Um, this was in London, Mark and I are both artists. Mark's going to talk more about his background, but maybe, uh, if you need to. But, uh, so, but in London, uh, in the mid 90s, the thing that was shaping our experience as artists was the growth of the young British artist scene, which was led by a big PR company, Saatchi and Saatchi. And this had a very particular effect on the art scene for us, which was to create a few celebrities that were promoted by a kind of media and PR machine that really took over uh, the dialogue and the discourse around art in London and in the UK more generally in a way that wasn't very comfortable for us. So uh, it made it uh, more about celebrity and less about kind of uh, more about celebrity, possibly more elitist, uh, showed less respect to audiences and um, made it harder for artists to make work that had political or social content, which were the things that interest us. Um, at the same time, we encountered... Mark had been working with a lot of pre-web network systems as artistic media and in an artistic context. And in the mid-90s in London, a cyber cafe had taken off called Backspace that was set up specifically for artists and uh, creative, did, creative people to understand why the internet might be interesting to them. And we taught ourselves to make some very ugly web pages, uh, put up some images of work that we thought was interesting and that deserved a platform but that wasn't, getting, uh, wasn't finding a platform in London galleries, uh, wrote short reviews and then shared it with uh, various email lists in Europe and America and Australia and the Middle East and suddenly found ourselves in a network of artists, techies and activists who were all exploring the space together. And it became a very dynamic space for critical conversations about what art can mean in a kind of global context and we understood that the most important thing we could do 
was to build our own art context together. So we started creating platforms. Okay, I'm going to compete with this booming bass and throw up this image. Okay, this will cheer us up. <laughs> so um, maybe you recognize this guy. This is Mark Zuckerberg, uh, a creator and owner of uh, Facebook. Um, so this, is, this was apparently Mark Zuckerberg's favorite image. And I'm throwing it up, I'm, I'm putting it on screen because it's a really useful contrast with kind of uh, different views on what is great about contemporary technology. So the thing that we have learned over the last 20 years through reflection is that digital technologies really shape our spaces and our lives. So these are our social spaces, our personal spaces, our political spaces. They tend to promote the values of those that fund and build them, and yet they affect the lives of us all. And so what's particularly delicious about this image is like Mark Zuckerberg is looking really happy. No one can see him. All the people in the crowd are kind of distracted by some spectacle that is like right in front of their eyes. And it's, it's an interesting metaphor for the way Facebook works. So Facebook provides us with platforms that invite us to stay very much at the surface. Meanwhile, all the profitable stuff is going on behind there, and we are distracted from looking at what's actually going on. Now, in the UK, a recent survey of digital attitudes by a group called Dot Everyone uh, discovered that while 50% of people in the UK believed that the internet, uh, the internet had improved their lives as individuals, only 12% felt that the internet had, had improved society. And this feels very important and an interesting uh, thing to be emerging now with the Cambridge Analytica uh, kind of scandals, in that because of the way our societies are set up, they're very, we're very focused, we, we are produced as uh, consumers rather than as co-producers of our societies. And this is kind of the way that uh, Facebook is operating, but also it makes it harder for us as individuals to construct our own societies. So this, this is the kind of uh, tension that I think we're going to explore really in our presentation and in the workshop later. So this is... This is, a this is also it's very similar to a book by Guy Debord called Society of the Spectacle when it's got uh, lots of people with dark glasses that can't see through the glasses. And it's, it's amazing, it's very similar to that. And that was written in like 68. 68, yeah. So it's, a, it's quite a poignant image in, in, in that sense as well. And Guy Debord uh, was a, a, a kind of Marxist activist, French, uh, in the 60s. And, uh, and his book, The Path of Situations, it's really uh, 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 text. Um, so, by contrast, this is our delicious vision of the web. So, uh, we, when we took to the web, we understood that, like punk, we wanted to build our own tools, build our own stage, get on the stage, make a noise, make our own culture. That was the spirit of it. And for the first 10 years, that was kind of what we did with artists and techies and activists from all over the place, connecting across distance and difference. And this was kind of really exciting. And it's quite hard to remember what it felt like to be doing that after Facebook, Google, all of these things which have made very smooth platforms for us to interact with each other. Um, uh, in 2006, the thing that we, this is a graphic, this here is a graphic from a project that we did called uh, the Do It With Others email art show. And the thing that we came to understand was that what the web, how the web changed the world for artists was that it put us in connection with each other and that it gave us a new view on collaborative practice. And we wanted to, we understood ourselves as making art together in a shared space. We created the space together. And then what the meaning that we made together was important. And this image is a 
distributed network, so it doesn't have one centralized authority. This is, uh, these, these images, these networked images are very important networked images, very influential images of the internet, which show suddenly that we are influencing each other. We're communicating in both directions, and that we're communicating across distance, and that we can communicate in a resilient way. You can remove one important node and we will navigate around it. So we've got, it's a very good way of understanding how digital, uh, digital infrastructure has changed the way we relate to each other and the way power moves in these kind of abstract spaces. And here the Daiwo image, we see images of people, groups, tools, ideas of security, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a network of feeling and uh, craft and other things that we can talk about for a long time. But these things are all kind of colliding with each other to create a space. There's also a dialogue manifesto. Yeah. So we created together a manifesto with a lot of the people we were working with. Or you could call it a manifesto. And, and the idea of the, the, what the manifesto set out was a kind of, uh, it was insisting that we need to understand our cultural space as a space that is co-created and that we can do, uh, we should aim for diversity that, and that we should acknowledge that we live in a networked age. So let's say since 1994 we see the growth of an artwork, uh, kind of artworks that take global digital networks as their medium. This is an image of an artwork called The Big Kiss. Uh, these two artists in this image, one is in Montpellier and one is in New York, and they are in their own spaces, they are performing an air kiss, uh, but the two images are spliced together and they're performing an air kiss live, and so they're performing uh, in real time a kiss. And a lot of the work in the kind of late 90s and early noughties were playing with how the net made us feel like we were together but were actually keeping us apart. And uh, we, this isn't the topic of this lecture, but there's really a lot of stuff to look at there and Annie Abrahams especially is a really interesting artist. So uh, she would often create interfaces where she removed all the kind of, all the glitz around it and would create very simple instructions for people to interact with each other in order to create an image together. And this, is, this was a 90-minute air kiss between two human beings separated by thousands of miles. And the other thing is, uh, is also just for Anne Abraham to say, she feels the more dysfunctional the technology is, the more human it is. So what... And, and, and so that it gets much more closer to our own kind of dysfunctionalities and that we have to find uh, problems to get over that and, and she feels that she understands dysfunction and much more than say perfection. So while, uh, while companies like Facebook and Twitter are aiming for a seamless experience where we forget that we're looking at a device, it just feels like it's part of us, her work is always kind of looking at the things that make things awkward or difficult or uncomfortable. And she finds value in that. And she thinks that's valuable. She's actually, uh, she's a trained, uh, I think she's a trained zoologist. So she has a PhD as a zoologist and uh, looking at animal behaviour. And she's brought that kind of expertise and research methodology to the web. And, and with the web, web came uh, people who were especially interested in networks as uh, media, as metaphors, as uh, platforms for distribution and ch exchange, especially a big rise in remix, appropriation, so taking things and reusing them, and intervention, so spaces that people don't expect to see art in, putting stuff in there. And really, our last 20 years' work has often been to make uh, technical abstractions and the way power moves through these things more visible and more feelable for more people. It feels important that we understand that this is the media of the day. Um, and I'm just going to finish up the intro by just showing you some spaces, so showing you some things that we've kind of shown people in spaces looking at this stuff. Uh, physical spaces are very important, which is why uh, Neem's presence here is so important, we think. Uh, 
we opened our first gallery. So we got our first, we, we kind of worked, everyone we knew was working in a kind of uh, subsidizing their own practice for about the first 10 years that we were all working. In 2005, we received our first piece of uh, Arts Council funding and we opened our first gallery. And this is, these images here are from the gallery and they show a HTML knitted blog. They show uh, another, this image here is a still life made across two locations. They show Mary Flanagan's giant joystick, which is an experiment in collaboration with a well-known game. Uh, we have Richard Barbrook playing Guy Debord's Game of War. I think he might be coming here soon, actually, so look out for him. Uh, and all of this was informed by uh, technical cultures of free Libra open source. So these are softwares that are made collaboratively by people and are distributed uh, to be free. This is free to use and free to manipulate as well. So instead of all the code being locked down, it's available for people to take and shape as they need it to, to make it useful for them. And also by peer-to-peer -peer cultures, which we'll come back to. We've, our longest running project has been our online platforms for debate and review and interview. Uh, we have an email list. We work now across lots of different channels. So we've got Net Behaviour, which is a, an email list thousand people uh, around the world uh, uh, promoting and also also collaborating uh, around ideas and technology and different and jobs and some people talk nonsense, some people talk interesting. Uh, but you, you, you know that you're in a place where you, you're going to know that the subject matter reflects uh, the medium that you're interested in, which is like art, technology and social change. And that's the kind of three key words. And I think a kind of uh, the sh ethos that is always there is an ethos of openness. So we're really interested in maintaining conversations or controversies or looking at things as they're changing and emerging. And we try and keep a space that is generous and open that people can contribute and part take part in. This is our gallery now. Uh, so we're based in this, it's a small building in the heart of Finsbury Park in North London. Uh, next to it is a playground, a boating lake, uh, and the park is used by 55,000 people a week. So it's very heavily used by people. There's 180 different languages spoken by the people in this park. So it's, uh, this is a totally wonderful place for us to be. We talk about quite difficult things and we ensure that anyone who walks through the door is made to feel welcome and part of the conversation. That's the kind of challenge we set ourselves. And finally, before I hand over to Mark, we have a lab space which is called Furtherfield Commons, which is based in a corner of the park. And from here we host uh, these kind of workshops, uh, presentations, we host a permaculture course and we host artist residencies and currently we have a long-standing uh, residency with an artist duo called They Are Here who are working with migrants and refugees on growing alternative economies and working with them they have also produced exhibitions about the experience of mi migrants and asylum seekers in London and the technologies and the way technologies impinge on their experience. So they have a, the project that they started on and that is an ongoing project is called Seeds from Elsewhere and they're working with uh, the migrants and refugees to plant, uh, plant and grow the seeds from the, that are from their own homeland and to see what it takes to cultivate and, and make those things thrive in British soil. Yeah, so about uh, when we move to the park, now when we have a six to eight week show, we'll normally expect to have about uh, 2,000 people through the door, uh, which is a really high number for a small alternative gallery in London. Uh, of those, about 80% are local park users, and the other 20% are from wider London and large international kind of audience figures of people who are coming specifically to see the show. So we're really happy with that mix. It means that we're getting a lot of people there who 
uh, wouldn't ordinarily normally feel that art was for them, uh, alongside people who are coming specifically for the things that we put on. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Mark. Okay, so this is some of the context uh, behind uh, the theory, but also some of uh, I prefer to think uh, uh, critical thinking rather than theory in a way. And uh, as you can see, we've, you've, you can see our gallery in the park there, and also uh, the House of Commons. Uh, you can see which one we prefer. And uh, in a sense, we feel that uh, meeting people on their own terms is much more potentially democratic and, uh, and, and uh, connecting rather than uh, uh, kind of some of the infrastructures that are in place right now. But that's, and so in a sense, What's so interesting, what we've been discovering regarding some of the technology that we're using, that the same kind of discussions that have been happening with technology, especially of open source culture, goes back, uh, uh, it's all around ownership. And uh, a lot of it's about ownership of property. Uh, and also, like, if you think of cables, uh, internet cables in different places, I know you've got uh, cables here in Cyprus that I don't know who owns those cables internet cables here, but uh, uh, land ownership is really important because it represents uh, uh, who owns what and who's in, who, who claims power over a particular uh, uh, kind of families and peasants and, and stuff like that. So, and, and we've been looking back at early English diggers and the true levellers, which that period was around Oliver Cromwell time and 1648 is the time for the levelers were they, their most powerful uh, time, which is post uh, the kind of Oliver Cromwell and the wars that they had around that time. Uh, and so, so in a sense, uh, this is so. If we consider proprietary controls in the British Isles, an enclosure uh, was the act of buying uh, the ground rights and all the common rights to accomplish exclusive rights of use, which increased the value of the land. The other method was by bar bypassing laws causing or forcing enclosure, such as parliamentary enclosure involving an enclosure act. So basically what that meant is that farmers that were there before that were just farming for their communities could just got kicked off when a couple of people that had more money than them decided to sod off. You, maybe if there's 200 of you, just us lots deserve it more than you when actually... And the thing about the diggers and the levellers they were actually like Quakers and they believed that no one should own the land, it was for everyone. So it's quite interesting uh, kind of uh, ethos that they were kind of promoting around that time. And also there's a good feminist uh, critique around this as well by uh, uh, Silvia Federici uh, from Caliban and the Witch, uh, Women and the Body and Primitive Accumulation highly suggested to read and it says aim at a control in nature the capitalist organization of work must refuse the unpredictability implicit in the practice of magic and the possibility of establishing a privileged relation with the natural elements as well as the belief in existence of powers uh, available only to particular individuals and thus not easily generalized and exploitable Magic was also an obstacle to the rationalisation of the work process and a threat to the establishment of the principle of individual responsibility. So above all, magic seemed a form of refusal of work, of, of subordination and an instrument of grassroots resistance power to power. That, uh, so the world has to be disenchanted in order to be dominated. And that's a really interesting point uh, regarding because uh, Federici is going back and looking at not just the say because traditional Marxist and socialist thinking is very kind of like around structures and quite masculine but Federici connects it up with the enclosures around feminism and how women were being victimized in the middle ages as well and that was actually uh, that lets us realize that the, 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 the biggest issue was very much around how we relate around ourselves in the patriarch. And so, so basically, and this brings us to the idea of around proprietary, so it's about ownership, 
and then proprietary, uh, proprietary and, and the differences between those. So the meanings of the words uh, proprietary and proprietary are closely linked. Proprietary is defined as meaning that one possesses, owns or holds the exclusive right of, to something, specifically an object. For instance, it can be described as something owned by a specific company or individual. And then the Cambridge Dictionary example of proprietorial, it says, like an owner, he put a proprietal arm around her. They're the two differences. So if you're talking about a product, it's proprietary. If you're talking about a human product, it's proprietorial. And that's patriarchal. And so, in the, so if I read this down there, blah, blah, blah. yeah, so here is a really interesting image of breaking glass which is a very, I don't know, anyone who really likes good punk films in the 80s, like I do, uh, and Jubilee is definitely uh, uh, a good one for that as well. So, uh, so you can see Hazel O'Connor there is like the protagonist in the film, and, uh, and, and I've put the quote there again, like an owner, he puts a, a proprietal arm around her, and uh, so a powerful image that I'll always remember from the 1980 post-punk movie Breaking Glass is when Hazel O'Connor, the talented and angry singer-songwriter, gradually loses agency and her sanity whilst uh, manipulated by the record company managers. She's grabbed and they hold her close to them. They're not necessarily aware of how suffocating they are, but there's not a betrayal of ownership at play. And, and that's instinctive. It's not like something that we all know that we're doing, especially men. Uh, it's something that we have to be re-educated about, obviously, to understand how bred that has been into that kind of psyche. And we're talking about kind of biopower and biopolitics here, which is a politics on the body. And it's very much about when 60s, 70s, 80s, politics around individuals and feminism uh, got really into, kind of, into gear. Into gear. And so the term biopolitics was first coined by Rudolf Kellen, who also coined the term geopolitics. And, and that was actually in 1905, which I don't put there. Oh, I'll put it here. And uh, it was later expanded by Michel Foucault, arguing that certain types of styles of government regulate their populations through biopower. And, Biopower is, uh, and by Hart and Negri kind of re-emphasise what that is, reinterpret it as biopower is a form of power that regulates life from its interior, following it, interpreting it, absorbing it, and re-articulating it. Which is a brilliant description of what's going on on Facebook. And remember back to that. It, that that's kind of, it's reaching into us and doing that. And so. Uh, so biopower is the concept Foucault used in, uh, uh, in uh, actually this is, this is a, taken from, uh, uh, what's her name, uh, Silvia Federici, uh, and she explains biopower as well, which is quite uh, poignant. So biopower is the concept Foucault used in history of sexuality and introduction in 1978 to describe the shift from an authoritarian form of government to one more decentralised, centred on the fostering of the power of life. And this is in the 19th century, in 19th century Europe. So biopower expresses the growing concern at the state level for sanity, sexual and penal control of individual bodies, as well as population growth and population movements and their insertion into the economic, economic role. According to this paradigm, the rise of biopower went hand in hand with the rise of liberalism and marked the end of the judicial of, uh, and monarchic state. And there's a really good quote, which I haven't used it because it's too long, but by Murray Bookchin, who's a kind of... Murray Bookchin, who's a really good American kind of uh, green anarchist writer. And he and he was kind of socialist at first, but then he turned into kind of a green anarchist writer. And he talks about forms of governance going back right back to tribal times uh, around and how the uh, it, uh, patriarch from that period of time 
uh, was actually embedded within kind of uh, monarchy, but also in religion. And it's a really interesting book. It's called what is it? Ecology of freedom. The ecology of freedom. Uh, so. This brings us to proprietal dominance in contemporary society. So I'm going to show examples of what that looks like. And so and we might recognise some of them, we might not. This is one example. Uh, this is uh, a guy called uh, Martin uh, Skrell, or Skrilly. And uh, the pharmaceutical industry demonstrated its own particular brand of proprietal lockdown, where the infamous Mar Martin uh, Squelly, founder and head of Turing Mar uh, Pharmaceuticals, raised the price uh, for Daraprim in September uh, from uh, $13.50 per pill to $750. The drug is preferably used for a parasitic condition known as toxoplasmosis, which can be de uh, for, uh, be for deadly, uh, well, which can be deadly for unborn babies and patients which compromise the immune systems, including those with HIV or cancer. His company, Turin Pharmaceuticals AG, bought the drug, moved it into a more uh, closed distribution system and th uh, than before, and instantly drove the price up. Soon after, he cut it down to $375 for some hospitals after a, uh, a mass public outcry. Even though many pharmaceutical companies held back at first and refrained from putting their own prices up, in the end they followed suits, and this was in the America. So 1350 to 750, that's a closed proprietary system. And another example, so I don't know if in, in London, lots of homeless, uh, uh, I mean, because of the austerity cuts in London and a lot of kind of mental, health uh, homes are being shut down and, and lots of people, mass homeless, it's just worse than ever. It, during this winter, 44, just 44 people, or well, 44 people died in London over winter. And they were all homeless. So it gives you an example how big that's getting now. And, but they can't sleep anywhere in London. So what they do, everywhere you go now in London, you see these spikes, and there's different types of spikes. and. And, and so that they kind of get moved on because people don't want to see the homeless because they are annoying and smelly. But they, a lot of them are mentally unstable for good reason because they were in some way they were being looked after before. And so, uh, and this is so another good example of uh, proprietal dominance over everyday culture and, uh, and a closed system. So example, and I didn't want to keep on going on about closed systems and proprietal dominance. What I want to do is just give a positive side of some of the ones that are opening things up, because it's actually quite a positive message that actually uh, there are actually some pretty um, decent people out there that are doing good things rather than just to... So this is kind of, I think, quite symbolic of... Uh, so the military whistleblower Bradley Manning becoming Chelsea Manning demonstrates a shift away from the dominant embodiment of the patriarch. Uh, uh, Bradley Manning on April uh, the 5th, uh, 2010, at the age of 22, gave classified diplomatic and military information to WikiLeaks. Uh, in Chase Maeder's book, The Passion of Bradley Manning, the story behind the WikiLeaks uh, whistleblower, an army intelligence uh, analyst who served with Manning said, Manning is brainy and he knows it. He also has a bit of a habit of thinking for himself, which can be a liability in the military. Manning released hundreds uh, and thousands of classified documents to the website WikiLeaks. The data included what became known as the Iraq war logs, cable gates and the Guantanamo files including footage of uh, the Baghdad airstrike that subsequently uh, criticized, was criticized as a war crime. Uh, gender expression and its updated revision is a very necessary terrain where psychological and traditional masculine tropes in our systems and institutions are in urgent need of change. 
diverse realities are finding their ways in everyday life situations that challenge the reality, the readily accepted role of the patriarch in society. Manning's transformation from a man to a woman was already a public event and linked more to gender expression than genitalia, says Michelle Joseph Toronto, uh, a based, Canadian-based musician who has undergone, undergone uh, gender transition. She's actually from some kind of gender show uh, that talks in Canada that's on telly quite a lot, but I've never heard of her till recently. Um, so, in contrast, Dana Lewis uh, has uh, decided to create uh, an artificial pancreas for diabetes. And so... Uh, Dana Lewis provides us with a technological example of unlocking proprietary system as an act of solidarity with peer diabetes sufferers. By, uh, by bypassing Hashim's narrative of ownership as a University of Alabama graduate, she was frustrated by the commercial diabetes monitoring devices. And as a member of the diabetes community for years, she created the Do It Yourself Pancreas System, which is DIYPS and was founder of the open source artificial pancreas system movement, which is Open APS. Uh, since then, a large online community has developed using D DYPS and advocating free and open source software as the way forward. And, uh, and that's a massive movement. Uh, for, as we all know, diabetes is a, a big problem. I've got it. And so it's a kind of, uh, and, and actually it will save money for National Health Service uh, if they decided to do this other than uh, pay for objects via licenses which are charging a lot of money. And uh, this is just another example of the kind of devices that she's been making uh, through with peer community uh, diabetes people. Uh, another example here is the Cube Cola. Uh, and this is a cube cola tea towel with the ingredients of Coca-Cola, uh, uh, but it's been for a group in Bristol, and it's, it's a group that uh, kind of overtook a, a cinema, and then now it's kind of been officially, uh, they officially bought their own cinema, and, and it's a kind of, uh, what is it? It's a grassroots group, and they, have, they show independent films, and but they also make their own drinks, and this is one of them. And to make extra money, they sell tea towels, so you can go home and make your own drink, and you make your own Coca-Cola, and you don't have to buy Coca-Cola. And because people like, like Coca-Cola with their vodka or whatever they have it in at the cinema, because people get drunk in Bristol quite a lot, and uh, that's the way to do it. And so it's another good example of breaking down a kind of uh, proprietary ownership and uh, if we think of neoliberalist culture, how kind of dominant that is over kind of uh, everyday life, you, uh, things like this send messages where people can actually take control, even on just an everyday level. It doesn't have to be overtly political, but it can be something that's quite community-based and where you break down the narrative that you have to buy something uh, in a way, because buying something almost says you're owned to some respect. There's a kind of a, a, a dialogue going on, but this means you own it in another way because you're making it. And so, and just to go to that, we're working with uh, Aboriginal artists. Uh, that we had an exhibition called Network in the Unseen and featuring Greta Lowe, who's a German Australian artist, and she collaborated with us, with a group in Australia called uh, the, the Wanayaka Arts Centre. And they're kind of working in media, like video and on the internet and mobile phone technology. And what they introduce, uh, one of the problems of Aboriginal artists is that when they want an exhibition, everyone wants their paintings. And, and they actually, they've moved on. But no one wants them to, but they want to. And so we thought, well, that's brilliant. We actually really like their work. And in a way, they mix their paintings into their media, so it's still there, it's just not on a painting on the wall. It becomes much more expansive into installations and things like that. And so the, the first exhibition of its kind uh, to focus on the intersection of indigenous cultures uh, 
and, and Zeitgeist Digital Practices in Contemporary Art in London. The exhibition event uh, series tackles from digital colonialism to remoteness and cultural marginalisation. And, uh, and what's so nice is that we can open that up so that breaks down that kind of proprietorial control and ownership of the art context and the art identity of the artists themselves, which in this case is Aboriginals. And I think I'll stop. This is a, uh, another project we called, called uh, we had an exhibition about drones a little while back, about 2012. And uh, Movable Borders is an ongoing research project that begins to explore possible answers uh, to these questions through facilit facilitating discussions around a re-territorialization re of the borderline in the, age, uh, in the information age. Uh, so particip participants are invited to come to the space to find out where drones actually come from. And, and so what they were doing was collaboratively building maps around the world where you can actually buy uh, small sections of drones because if you deliver the whole drone, uh, that actually is a war weapon. But if you deliver small parts of a drone, uh, it's not a war weapon. It's, it's uh, an object that you're just delivering. No one necessarily knows what that's going to be used for. And so, uh, and, 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 and one of the biggest issues around, uh, uh, well, NATO and UN is that there are rules about uh, delivering uh, military objects around the world, especially if it's a whole tank or uh, a, a, a guns or whatever. And so uh, the way they got around it is actually just send the bits themselves from different places that end up in one place. Then you can make that weapon. And so, so what we did, was to deconstruct that kind of narrative and break it down to see uh, where all the actual objects came from. A lot of them from different illegal countries that shouldn't have been selling uh, some of this stuff, but it's not, you wouldn't see that in the newspaper. And so this was just every day people come into the space that wanted to find out about where uh, uh, the kind of context of breaking down the phones, so if you just think of it as a mobile phone, a mobile phone has 700 different bits in it, generally from all different parts of the, the world. And if you're thinking, in, thinking ecologically, mobile phones are really unecological because of that. And so, and so, and this in a way is a similar process, similar approach. Uh, this is quite, uh, this, we had a, kind of mock, the Museum of Contemporary Commodities in 2005, uh, 2015, uh, with artist Paula Quachlow, and she worked with uh, Garrett Foote and geographer Ian Cook, and they kind of created an exhibition around commodity with local people around our park. But one of the characters uh, uh, that was at this uh, was, uh, uh, did I write more about this? Google. It's the Michaela Google doll from Germany, and basically, uh, Michaela. Uh, what does she do again? She kind of. She was, the, so children. So the doll uh, consults Google search to answer your children's questions, basically. So it's using very kind of low, low level AI consults Google, but essentially it's a child and family surveillance unit. And uh, she, so she... It was banned. It was banned. It, 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 there was a big hoo-ha about it. But what Paula did was that she uh, retrained uh, the Kayla doll uh, to answer different questions or answer questions in a different way and made her go and search for different sources. So she, she turned uh, the Kayla doll into a radical, basically, which was quite an interesting thing to do. Always good, yeah. and and so the other thing at the moment, because debt in the UK uh, since austerity has been so uh, uh, influencing everyday culture, uh, a group have turned up called Bank Job, and what they've done uh, to pay off uh, certain people's debts, and this is in a borough of Walthamstow in London, uh, they've decided to create their own money. And, uh, and they've even taken over an HSBC bank 
and and they're called now called HBC or something. HBCS. That's it. They changed the words around. And so basically, what happens? You can go to this bank and go online as well. And so, uh, fifty percent of each note goes goes towards uh, goes towards paying off. Uh, uh, people's debt because like we've got something in the UK called payday loans and and it's very extortionate uh, to pay off especially the poor people because they're so desperate uh, they'll just want the money now because they need it to feed their kids or whatever and and uh, and they don't think about the consequences because uh, you know because they're desperate and so what happens uh, you get people so in debt they, they end up losing their homes, everything. And so these people have come along to, to eradicate their debt and create a new economy around that. And then, so 50% of it goes off to pay off their debt and 50% goes back into the business to keep it going. And so, and so this is a guy who's in the community uh, and it's uh, so Gary Nash of Eat or Heat Food Bank, so which is established in 2013. Eat or Heat is a charity that provides a food bank to people in Walden Forest affected by a deteriorating economic situation that are having to choose between. Uh, and obviously, you can see that's 50 pounds. And uh, so they're selling the bank notes. Yeah, so you actually get that physically. And then this is Tracy. You know, and so Tracy is a head teacher of the the primary school, local primary school called Barncroft, and uh, and so and she says here the school encourages people's parents and staff to work together to secure the best possible future for the children that attend, regardless of economic, social, or cultural backgrounds. That's her kind of comment there, and so basically she's one of the local heroes and. The guy before is a local hero. Another local hero is Steve. And so he belongs to the Soul Project, a youth space that engages young people between the ages 8 to 14 years old in positive activities that contribute to uh, growth of the community. It is currently being forced out at the moment because of the austerity cuts uh, of its building and seeking new ways of being able to provide a setting for young people to to hang out and a variety of workshops and activities including games, dance, sports and music, through its program, etc. And so these people uh, we see as heroes, you know, not the pop stars. These are the people that we value and they're the people that teach us how to do our arts. And because uh, they give us the understanding the context of an art that goes beyond objecthood. And so, and Another group we've been working with uh, called uh, Fair Co-op in Spain. Uh, as you probably know, there's a lots, lots of kinds of uh, big changes going on in Spain, especially kind of since they had their own crash. And uh, basically, Fair Co-op created a Fair Coin as well, and that's actually on the blockchain. Uh, so, as I say, our mission is to create an innovative global, local economic system from bottom up in favour of an alternative and post-capitalist. So their terms are because I would say post-neoliberal because I'm not against capitalism and I just think when people say post-capitalist I think it's a little bit uninformed and I actually think low-grade capitalism, everyday capitalism is a form of survival and everyone should be allowed to have an entry point into it. It's when it's taken away from them, from them when it becomes a really big problem and uh, where you can't allow meritocracy to actually, in reality, be a part of that culture. That's the real problem. And so, uh, so I, I dispute that slightly. But they're still, what's so ironic is that they're getting engaged in capitalism to, to solve the problems that they have with capitalism. And uh, so bottom up in favour of an alternative post-capitalist model to pave the way for a collective change towards a life in common cooperation, solidarity and transparency are their key factors and, and, and they want a system uh, uh, of justice that works for everyone. Uh, and so basically, you know, they work with peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, hacker ethics, which we work with hacker ethics as well, and peer-to-peer -peer foundation uh, as well, which is a group that's... Um, I won't go into that one. 
And so basically they're international. I mean, they also are part of over 600 people just outside Barcelona, which has got its own territory. It's its own community and they've got their own jobs. And so it's like a mini country just outside, outside Barcelona. And it's a very safe version. You've got Rojava in Syria, obviously, was more uh, being attacked at the moment by Turkey, which is going to go down. But it, that's a larger version, which is like 4,000 people there. And then uh, here, you've got 600 in Spain, which is uh, less contestable uh, in the sense it's going to stay there longer because they're much more integrated within that society, culturally, like with families and, and things like that. And so I won't talk about that for too long, but that's them at our space in London, uh, which, is a, which we're now working with the Faircoin. We're the Faircoin London Known. London Known, sorry, London Known. And, uh, and that's our Firth Commons. And so some of them, uh, and that's from Bank, the guy we run, he's from Bank. And uh, then there's Max Dovey. So there's blockchain people there. And uh, that's my bit done, isn't it? I think. Let's have a look. Yeah, now <laughs> So that gives you an idea, in a way, that some of the kind of philosophy, politics, and critique around um, where we're coming towards the blockchain, which we're going to be showing now. So I'm going to aim for 20 minutes, if you can bear it, and then we'll break and we can have a chat over some snacks, I think. Uh, so. This last, uh, this last section will be focused on our work around blockchain. So around 2015, we launched a program called Art Data Money. And we launched this, uh, we basically invited people to come and work with us to think about how uh, big data and blockchain might provide us with ways to rethink the economy for the arts. And these were some of the problems that we'd identified. So there's, and, and it's, I'm, I will be curious in discussion with you to discover whether this holds true for people here in Cyprus as it does for the UK. So there's this kind of awkward relationship between the value of arts to society and the way it's resourced and funded. So uh, funding can be public, corporate or private, but the value is, uh, can be social, economic or innate. And these things together set up quite an awkward relationship. Um, in the UK now, there's, it's getting harder and harder for younger artists to find a way to thrive and, and survive. And generally, it's harder for people at the especially for younger people to find jobs that are satisfying and that have any stability to them. In London especially, it's really hard. In the meantime, there's a kind of increasing centralization in the arts and a, and a sameness that is coming as a result of a move, that, a kind of tendencies in the high art markets. Uh, we also see in the art markets, arts as a vehicle for speculation and money laundering. Um, so art as an asset class, which is a very different approach to art than a lot of artists uh, have in their minds when they decide they want to become art artists. So these are, these are some of the kind of things that we've been looking at. Okay, so I'm going to... Would you, would, would you like me to have a go at talking about blockchain so that, I mean... Who here, I suspect there's at least one person in the room who could probably give us a pretty good definition of what the blockchain is and why it's important. How many people here feel like they know what the blockchain is? Okay. Um, would it, is it useful for me to talk about what the blockchain is for those who aren't here? Okay, so we'll do it. Um, so I think this is a reasonable, and anyone who would like to disagree with me, jump up, shout, tell me, it, tell me I should be describing it differently. Okay, so I think this is a very dry, reasonably accurate description of what it is. It's a decentralized database, cryptographically secured by a network of computers. Now, this is so boring to consider that it's really hard to think about what it means or why it might be useful. Um, 
the, I, the way that the most, the simplest way I find to understand it is to remember that what banks do is handle databases or ledgers of transactions. So the reason we have uh, national or international banks is for them to keep track of all the exchanges that are happening between people, to keep track of the money moving around. And basically, uh, what blockchain does differently is that it holds that ledger or a database, but it's distributed across many different computers and the people who own them. So instead of us having to trust the, the banks when they tell us where the money is, we know that uh, we, we trust that there is now a computational process that is maintaining the secure information about money that is shared across this network. Um, the blockchain was uh, the underpinning technology for Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency. It was announced with a white paper by a uh, pseudonymous uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, who we don't, know who, we don't know who this person is or whether they were more than one person. Uh, the white paper was pu published in 2008 as the financial crash was really kind of uh, at its height. And as the banks were being bailed out with public taxpayers' money. And there are little messages hidden in the early blockchain, so you can hide messages in these kind of record in the, in the ledger. Uh, so one was a quote from uh, Alistair Darling, who was the British Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, announcing the bailing out of the banks. Uh, with public taxpayers' money, so there's a kind of there's a, there's an implication of some kind of politics at play here. So this is money freed from government or bankers' control, and that's that's a lot of what the kind of uh, ethos of it is. So let's think about what this means. Um, uh, the blockchain is described as Internet of Money or Internet of Assets whereas the web was the internet of communication or messages. Um, but let's go back further. So uh, the internet is a network of computers. Okay, we're gonna go right back. The internet is a network of computers. Computers store information in a database and they also hold a collection of software to manipulate and move that information around. So it moves it from one data, it moves it within the database. <coughs> Uh, in 1991, the web gave us a way to access the data on the network of computers around the world. In the early noughties, peer-to-peer -peer technologies enabled file sharing on a global scale. So things like Napster uh, and uh, what are other famous ones? BitTorrent. So torrents, yes. Yeah, so a way for us to kind of um, do still file movies. sharing. Still movies, still music. That's what everyone knows it for. Um, by 1999, we had ubiquitous computing, i.e. computers everywhere. So they start moving into our pockets in our mobile phones, and we uh, start to get the Internet of Things. So we have these computers living amongst us, and it starts to become more of a surveillance technology. Uh, 2008, as I've said, we see Bitcoin, which is the first digital currency. Blockchain is the underpinning technology, and it allows a secure anonymous and transparent way to record all tra transactions to a decentralized database or ledger. Uh, and out of this are all kinds of nefarious things which are discussed in this uh, exhibition actually. So the dark web or deep web is, a, is attached to this and used by drug dealers, assassination markets, all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, yeah, drug dealers could just like have, uh, well, we know what? Yeah, we're not going to go into that though. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can ask us about that when we're off camera. Um, so, <laughs> 2013, uh, people started to understand that the blockchain could be used for more than just digital currency. Uh, with uh, announcements about Ethereum, so this is kind of like wave two blockchain, which instead of just running digital currency across the blockchain, people understood that they could run software across it. And this started to be described as the decentralized planetary scale computer. So you start to have a piece of software, instead of having software limited to one computer, the software is run decentralized in the same way that the database is. And this then is given rise to 
a massive kind of light, very similar to the early days of the web. We're seeing these booms and busts of hype and interest and investment and all this kind of stuff. Um, blockchain evangelists are now promising uh, that it will f facilitate the automation, monetization, and marketization of every transaction on the global database. So, if you're like me, you read that and it's really hard to think about what any of that is going to mean, and it still feels quite boring. It sounds kind of very inflated, but it's still quite boring and quite hard to think about. Um, which is why we kind of got artists involved, but I haven't finished talking about how they work. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit more. So I think we understand now that the database is main, maintained across a distributed network of computers. Uh, and every time there's a transaction, uh, so someone spends a bit of Bitcoin, and this goes into, and these, these then, they all happen in a timeline, and about every 10 minutes, it might be a little bit more at the moment, about every 10 minutes, these are gathered together into a block. And uh, in order to seize the transaction fees from that block, you have to solve a very difficult maths problem, or your computer does, you don't as a human being. So your computer solves a very difficult maths problem, and that block is then, uh, it's the, you're rewarded with Bitcoin for having solved the problem, and you get some of the trans, you get a proportion of the transaction fees. And that block contains a hash or a, a cryptographic um, translation, which is basically, uh, it's a way of proving that this block contains a little bit of data that shows its order in the line of all the previous blocks that have ever been made. And this happens about every 10 minutes. People on the network get to compete to solve a difficult maths problem and win the transaction fees and the Bitcoin associated, associated with that block. That process is called mining. And the reason it creates value or people it's worth doing is that it uses energy to do that. And in order to fake it, you would have to expend more energy than would be worth doing to fake the information in that ledger. Okay, um, for those of you that already know it, does anyone want to improve on that as a description of how it works? For those of you that don't know it, you're probably, your head's probably starting to spin a bit and you're starting not to care. Uh, and don't worry about that. It'll, it, it just really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we don't all know the deep technical reasons about how the internet works you know it works and we use it for certain things but it seemed worth giving me at least a little go right i'm going to talk a little bit more about how things work so we've talked a little bit, bit about mining none of these graphics are mine I, this is quite a nice one block geeks puts out really nice uh puts out really nice graphics so there's now, so this is a very high energy using system, and this is one of the great problems, and that's been one of the big controversies around Bitcoin especially, which is really consumes a lot of energy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you a graph about this in a minute. But so there's new systems. The system of agreeing that the ledger is what it says it is, is called a consensus process. And there are now new proposals for different consensus processes coming up. Uh, Bitcoin uses proof of work, which is the mining system that I've just described. Uh, and e Ether currently uses proof of work, so there's a whole load of different cryptocurrencies. And Ether is currently planning to move to proof of stake. So this will be energetically a lot cheaper. Uh, but there's political problems with it because essentially it privileges those who already have an investment. So it's basically, acute, again, it's looking to reinforce inequalities of wealth and resource. Um, what might they be used for? Okay, this also isn't my graphic, but I found it quite useful. So there's kind of four main categories of uh, development going on. There's security, so this is all the stuff around the kind of financial financial markets and the um, the services that those are attached to. There's smart contracts, so that's all the stuff that means that we are now using a planetary scale computer. And the things that they're I'm going to talk 
much more about the things that happen in this area. But we have uh, digital rights, so attaching IP and reproducing digital scarcity. So for the last 20 years, it's been very hard for people to say, this is my digital image, I made it, you need to pay me for it. And what we're seeing now with blockchain is the opportunity for people to say, this is my image, if you use it, you need to pay me for it. We can use systems for understanding that this is my original image and then uh, being, having ways to have that payment made in a way that is efficient and doable and without involving loads of intermediaries like lawyers and banks. Um, we have digital currency and crowdfunding that can happen through that. And then we have all the stuff around to, uh, record keeping. I mean, essentially, it's a record. It's an endless record that can't be changed. And uh, so attached to these things, we are looking at the autom automation and the ease of use around new systems for voting, ownership, healthcare record keeping, title records, all this kind of stuff. Um, Thinking about uses, okay, so this is one of our favorite use cases, and this is something that's currently being built. There's a music streaming service coming out called Resonate, uh, and it streams, it's streamed to own. So in nine plays, you have no, no monthly subscriptions, you only pay for what you play, and after nine plays, you own the music. And it's run on a platform co-op, it's a platform cooperative model, which means that musicians and labels take, take profit, so do the fans, and uh, anyone who uses the service, either as a musician, a label, or a fan, uh, they get to vote on the governance and on the distribution of those profits. So it's this whole folding back, it's the redemocratization of money, and this is really exciting to us. This is kind of why Furtherfield's been interested in it from the start. We see all the work around pl platform cooperativism as the possibly starting to reverse some of the problems around uh, Uber and Airbnb and the Deliveroo around the gig economy, because what you could see is the workers of these companies being the owners of these companies, so you get a much, you, they have more of a say over what their working conditions are. No, but they do if they start to run on blockchain it, using the platform cooperative method like, like is offered here. Okay. Um, this is when we started playing around with blockchain and thinking about it, so in January 2015. This is the, it's a graph of the total market capitalization of blockchains. And um, this is the total market capitalization of blockchain cryptocurrencies. This here is what it did in December. You'll have heard it in the news, or those of you that own it will have seen the prices go up like 400% really over a couple of months, and then a crash. So we're seeing big volatility in the markets, in the cryptocurrency markets. And um, this is the electricity consumption graph that I want to show you. So currently, the global Bitcoin production has the same energy consumption as Iceland, and it's predicted to go up. It's, uh, it's a really energy inefficient system, and that's one of the things that we would look at in the, that's one of the things we plan to look at in the workshop. Okay, so, um, I'm not going to go through this. I'm just going to say we've been working with blockchain because we think that it's really important to diversify the forces, the, the voices, and the kinds of people that are interested in shaping this space. Because this space looks like it's really going to change the way we do a lot of things, uh, socially, politically, and financially. And we think more and more different kinds of people need to be in this space. And we produce films and exhibitions and a book and a whole series of workshops. Uh, you'll see uh, the DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And these are autonomous organizations. They're machine-based organizations, companies that run on the blockchain. So. While the blockchain can now do money without banks, we're looking at companies that can run in a fairly automated way once they've been set up. 
And the thing that started us down this route was working with an uh, artist and hacker called Rob Myers, who is very interested in technical systems. And he produced this paper called Dowo, Dow it with others. So it was taking our Daiwo plan and looking at how we might work with these, work with automation systems to do kind of experimental artistic work with these automation systems. This is what the art world in blockchain looks like two years on. It's moved really fast into this space. The business of art has moved really fast into the blockchain space. Uh, most of this isn't our world. It isn't the world of Fernfield, but there are companies moving in, uh, issuing tokens, questions of authenticity, securitization, so really working with art as an asset class, uh, art as a class for speculation, around insurance and lending. Provenance is very important, so this is saying we know this artwork is a Rembrandt and putting that kind of uh, authentication onto the blockchain. But we've been involved in is the medium and subject matter. So art is working with the blockchain as a medium. And I'm going to talk about a couple of examples from the book. So we, we put this out in kind of last September, and our idea was not to do more marketing for blockchain, but really to involve creative people in thinking about how the world would be different and how it might feel different. So it was like a future artifact of a time before blockchain changed the world. So we're kind of thinking forward in order to think back. And we worked with uh, experimental publishers called uh, Nathan Jones and Sam Skinner of Talk to produce the book. And you can come and have a look at it in a bit. It's also free online uh, version. Oh, that's me going over. Where's the... So I think I'll pick out three examples. Uh, we have here, we have an uh, illustration from a fiction by Elie Carus. Um, and this is a, they have a fictional interview with a political scientist called Dr. L. Goddard. And in this, they talk about the time before blockchain as a time of barbarity. And the example they give is they say, in these times, before the time when you could vote for your own government, when you could choose your own governance system as a service, so your politics as a service, people would be stuck with the governance system that they were born into. And so people used to go and be born, in, they would choose the country that they wanted to be born into for its governance system. So it's kind of setting up this idea that social and societal systems should all be marketable and marketized, and that we should all be able to choose everything. It's a really, uh, it's a very interesting model, and it's the only time I have found that argument a little bit uh, appealing. This idea of the kind of marketization of political systems is a very, it's, it's an interest, it's interestingly explored. Um, I think I'm just going to talk about plantoids. So there's a whole series of artworks that are made to look at the relationship between blockchains and natural systems. And this was a really early work by uh, Primavera of Ochaos. Uh, she describes it as an evolutionary algorithm that combines aesthetic beauty and automated governance. Uh, it, it was exhibited as part of New World Order exhibition. It's a metal plant that uh, glows and moves when you tip it with Bitcoin. So there's a QR code, you tip it with Bitcoin, it dances and moves, and, and or ether. And it accumulates cryptocurrency, and when it reaches a certain amount, it triggers a commission to commission an artist to make its babies. Uh, this is actually one of the child plantoids and it has these two elements, so it has a physical body, but it also has at its heart uh, what she describes as its DNA, which is the smart contract. And these are the rules that determine what its, how its children could be made. And it'll, it, it, determines, it might determine its size. It also might determine its financial model. So there's a charitable plantoid, for instance, that says 50% of the tips will go to a charity of our choosing. 
or it might decide to enrich a single individual. So it's putting the kind of money governance at the heart of the artwork as well. Um, it's also a pyramid scheme, so all the child plantoids all feed money up to the mother plantoid, uh, which is an interesting parallel to how uh, current cryptocurrencies also work. Early investors do well. Uh, this is the schema. I'm not going to talk about Terra Zero, but it's very interesting. And I'm going to finish up talking about this. So we're hoping to work with Harvest. This is a blockchain artwork by a critical engineer, Julian Oliver. It's a critical climate change artwork, and it uses a wind turbine to power a cryptocurrency mining rig which then funds climate change research. So it's using the kind of uh, controversy that surrounded uh, the Bitcoin energy usage as its kind of medium. And it, so it uses the turbine and we're looking at working with him on a turbine and uh, solar power. We want to have this installed at further field and we're using this as the basis for our workshop so to use this to fund environmental and ecologically focused public commissions in public space. Uh, so this would be carbon zero, producing money for public good. This feels like an interesting thing for us to explore. And I think I'll leave it there. Just last mention about the voting, uh, uh, how people choose projects. Why don't we come to that with the, yeah. I think everyone needs a rest. We've talked for far too long. Um, yes. So, would you like? Are there questions, or would it? Is it better if we just uh, have conversation over food? Let's do that.